Hey everyone, this is Nick and Ubuntu 22.04 is out. It's an LTS release, which means it will stay relevant for a long time, until 2027 as a matter of fact. It will also be used as the base for a lot of user-centric distributions like Elementary OS, Linux Mint, Zorin OS and a lot more. But how good is it this time around, really? Because this time, Ubuntu has actually fixed some of the issues that made me drop it as a recommendation for beginners. What I never dropped as a recommendation though is today's sponsor. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is the best choice to deploy your own Linux or gaming server. Getting started is extremely easy thanks to their app marketplace. You can just pick from one of the many, many apps they offer select a few configuration options and just one click deploy that server. It's super simple. It works for a development environment, but also for a Minecraft or Valheim server. Among the most notable apps, Linode has Moodle to create your own learning management system and teach and sell courses in minutes, but they also have stuff like Pi-hole to block ads. But please don't block mine because I need money to buy more games for the Steam Deck. From Focal Board, a Trello alternative to Rocket Chat, which is the equivalent to Slack or Teams, Linode has everything you would want. Click the link in the description to get your $100 credit and get started. So, Ubuntu 22.04, Jammy Jellyfish. It's an LTS, it's going to be supported up until 2027, and it's probably going to get three to five years of extended support as well for Ubuntu Advantage customers. It uses the Linux kernel 5.15, because that's also an LTS release. It ships Mesa 22 for drivers, and interestingly, it moved directly to GNOME 42, which means that no Ubuntu release got GNOME 41 at all. That's actually a good thing, because it means that Ubuntu is now again following the normal release schedule for GNOME, and it's no longer shipping a mishmash of older GNOME desktops with newer GNOME apps or vice versa. It should be smoother and a lot more stable. Of course, as always, users will be able to upgrade to the future releases of Ubuntu, either the non-LTS ones or jump straight from 22.04 to the next LTS, 24.04. And while Jammy Jellyfish still keeps its locked application versions and library versions in the repos, meaning you'll only get security updates for anything that's not a snap or a flat pack if you added that yourself, they will also have the same hardware enablement program as usual, with regular drops of newer kernels and newer drivers, to ensure that 22.04 stays usable on newer devices for the next two years. So yeah, basically it's an LTS, but it's nice to see them catching up to the version of GNOME that other distributions tend to ship. They're not holding back anymore. There are also a few things that are not going to be shipping with this release, namely the new Flutter-based Ubuntu installer, because it's not ready yet, and the new firmware tool that's also Flutter-based, which also is not ready yet. Under the hood, there's also a major change. Wayland is the default for everyone including NVIDIA proprietary driver users. This means that X11 just lost a major foothold in the desktop market. Fedora 36 will also make the same move, and while you can still reinstall X, I guess a lot of people will stick to the default, as GNOME's Wayland support is pretty much perfect these days. It also means you get these sweet one-to-one -one touchpad gestures that make using GNOME on a laptop so amazing. Now let's see what's new on the visual front, because Ubuntu 22.04 also refines the Yaru theme and icons. This new theme is really more of an adaptation of the new GNOME 42 lib Vita style. In the shell, you don't get these little arrows pointing to the element you clicked on. You get fully rounded menus instead. And they're all white by default, as these menus will now respect the light or dark mode you chose. The system menu also has a redesigned look, with submenus being more visually linked to their parent elements. These soft grey on pure white accents aren't the most legible ever, but they still work. The purple aubergine color is now gone as well in the shell, replaced by the traditional Ubuntu orange. I personally really liked the purple and orange color combo, but it also reminded me of the French train company which also triggered memories of me not actually being able to ride a train because these bastards are on strike every holiday. In the settings, you can still go dark mode in the appearance tab, but there's also a nice change. 
accent colors. Ubuntu didn't wait around for GNOME to add these and they made the change themselves, bringing it up to par with KD Plasma, Elementor iOS or Zorin OS. The selection of colors isn't customizable and some of them look a bit too vibrant to my eyes, but they're still pretty nice to have. The accent color is applied to all highlights in various applications, to the shell's interactive elements and to the folder icons as well. It even transitions smoothly from one color to the other so it's not jarring. Same goes for the dark mode with a nice fade between light and dark. To complete the new look, you get new on-screen display elements, smaller, rounder, less intrusive, and that's a good thing. You'll also notice that no default app looks like the Advita theme, despite using GNOME 42, which includes libadvita. And that's, as far as I know, because Ubuntu doesn't ship libadvita. They decided to stick to older application versions that aren't compiled with libadvita at their core, or versions of GNOME 42 ified applications that don't rely on libadvita. We will probably have to wait for the next release to see what Ubuntu does. Either they can ship a remixed version of libadvita by changing the style sheet to Yaru, they could also decide to include libadvita as is and have the default advita theme, or they could try and maintain versions of applications that don't depend on libadvita at all so they can be themed. I suspect it's the first option and they probably just didn't have enough time to test everything out. Oh, and there's the new logo, at startup and in the about page. I like it, but I know a lot of people don't. It would probably look less weird if it wasn't that tall. And there's also a new wallpaper, which I find really nice. I love these geometric renderings of animals and at least it keeps the purple tones in. The Ubuntu desktop also brings a bunch of changes this time around and it's a good thing because I felt that they kind of stagnated in place for the previous two or three releases. First, you get all the nice improvements of GNOME 40, 41 and 42. So if you were coming from the previous LTS, you're in for a nice bunch of changes. The apps grid is way more responsive. It scrolls horizontally and it lets you rearrange icons as you please into folders or not. The whole desktop is also a lot more responsive and faster, and it can even run on a Raspberry Pi 4 this time around. You also get horizontal workspaces, which are bigger, easier to use, easier to drag your windows or your app icons into. They still kept the dock on the left side and they added a few nice things to it. First, it now holds the trash can, so that thing is not cluttering your desktop and it also displays all removable media and network devices. You can disable both of these behaviors in the appearance settings. You can also move that dock to any side of the screen and make it look like a real dock without it extending from screen edge to screen edge. If you were using Ubuntu 20.04, you'll also be happy to note that desktop icons ew, are now way better integrated. You can drag and drop stuff from the desktop to the file manager and vice versa and the right-click menu looks a lot more like a native context menu for GNOME than it ever did before. For some reason, all the new icons that get added to the desktop are added in the bottom left corner. I don't really understand why that makes sense, but since I also don't really understand why you would want desktop icons in the first place, I'm not the best person to judge. From GNOME 42, you also get the new screenshot UI, which isn't a dedicated app anymore, but more of an overlay. It lets you do the exact same things, as in take a screenshot of the whole desktop, a section of it, or of a window. And it lets you show or hide the mouse pointer and even record the desktop itself. It doesn't have an option to use a delay before taking the screenshot, but that shouldn't be needed, as menus and pop-ups now appear on screenshots if they were open when you press the print screen key. You'll even get a nice small indicator in the top bar to let you know that you're recording your screen and you can click it to end it. All in all, whether you're coming from 21.10 or 20.04, there are a bunch of changes that should make your life easier and the desktop a lot smoother and faster. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your position on this packaging format, Ubuntu still uses snaps for a few default apps, including Firefox, for example, which means you will have to deal with a long first run experience. The Ubuntu software store finally started to catch up to the default GNOME software with nicer app pages, more space for screenshots, more legible information about download size, safety and update notes. It's still not as smooth, its category pages aren't as detailed, without recommended apps, 
and it still doesn't have all the information that GNOME software has, like links to the project, the open source or free software status of a program, and more. It's too bad, really. I don't understand why this kind of information cannot be added to the Ubuntu software store as well. It's been there for two releases of GNOME now. And maybe it's snaps that don't support all that kind of metadata. Maybe the Ubuntu team doesn't think it adds anything to the mix. But I personally think that the Ubuntu software app should be a carbon copy of the GNOME software app using snaps instead of flat packs. There is no good reason I can think of for it to not be up to date with GNOME software. But hey, I guess this gives me a reason to complain. The app loadout hasn't changed at all apart from that. You still get the latest stable versions of Thunderbird, Firefox, LibreOffice and Shotwell. You also get older versions of GNOME apps like Calendar, which is not version 42, or the Settings app, which is also not the latest version, but it's not as bad as it usually is on Ubuntu. It does mean that not all apps have these cool bottom rounded corners though. And at least most non-GNOME third-party apps seem to be provided as snaps this time around, which means that they will get feature updates and they won't stay locked in to the repo versions, which is a good thing. I would still love Ubuntu to just ditch the snaps for desktop applications. For server, they're fine. For desktop, they should really just move over to Flatpak, just like virtually everybody else, and help make that format better if they have complaints about how it works. But yeah, I mean, at least users of 22.04 can still get app updates through Snap, which is good. Now let's move on to a quick rundown of the main Ubuntu flavors. Ubuntu 22.04 gets the latest KDE Plasma, version 5.24, with its new overview effect, much inspired by the GNOME Activities view, the newer notification system, the new Breeze theme, and the accent colors as well. Apart from that, you also get the latest releases of Thunderbird, Firefox, and LibreOffice, and all KDE frameworks are up to date. Nothing too special here, Kubuntu does tend to stick to vanilla KDE as much as possible, so if you want to know everything that went on in this latest release, you can check the video in the card up top. Ubuntu Mate gets a lot of changes. It uses Mate 1.26.1, with full compatibility with the Yaru theme, including all accent colors. Users of previous releases will be moved over to the new theme automatically, as the old ones got the boot. There's also full support for the dark theme, some interesting AI-generated wallpapers, and there are a lot of improvements to the Mate Tweak tool, with better reliability for desktop layout switching. The default image is also 41% smaller than the previous one, by removing unused stuff that can be optionally downloaded at install. They even managed to add GNOME clocks, GNOME maps, and GNOME weather to the default install. It also supports regular packages, snaps, app images, and Flatpak out of the box, so you can use whatever source you prefer, and of course the minimal install option is still there. Mate also transitioned to the Ayatana indicators, which should make all these notification tray icons work properly. Those are big, big updates to Ubuntu Mate, and I'm still very surprised at the amount of work and passion the community still pours into Mate. It's great to see. Ubuntu Studio still uses KDE Plasma, version 5.24 this time, with all the same changes that Ubuntu 22.04 brings. The previous LTS used XFCE, so if you're moving from that, you'll get a wholly different experience. All included software got bumps to their latest stable versions, and the Studio Controls app got improved mixers and plugins. It also moves to Pipewire by default, which seems to mean that you might need to use the command line to manage it, as the default Ubuntu Studio tools don't seem to have been updated just yet to take advantage of it. Ubuntu Studio is still an amazing choice for everybody who needs a complete multimedia studio workstation. They provide everything. Lubuntu 22.04 won't be using LXQt 1.1, unfortunately, so it's going to be stuck on 0.17. This is a shame, as 1.1 brought a ton of improvements to this lightweight desktop environment. Lubuntu still adds KDE's Discover Package Manager, and it's also moving to the Calamares installer instead of the default Ubuntu one. It also gets an update to its File Manager, PCMan FM, which is a bit more full-featured. I'm kind of bummed that they couldn't find the time to include the latest release, but I guess there just wasn't enough time to test it out properly. 
Asperg's Ubuntu 22.04, it doesn't get a new version of XFC. It's still on 4.16, just like 21.10 was. But there's initial support for GDK4 and libhandy in the default Greybird theme, which means that GDK4 apps from GNOME shouldn't look horrible. Thunar, the file manager, also should perform better. Looks like Zubuntu 22.04 is more of a point release than a full complete update apart from the internals. Now hopefully XFC 4.17 will bring more new stuff to the table. Finally, Ubuntu Budgie. It uses version 10.6 of that desktop with better support for Ayatana indicators and notification tray icons. And Evolution and Thunderbird can now integrate with the desktop notification system. The GNOME control center is replaced by the Budgie control center, which gives you all options to configure your desktop how you like it. It also updates a bunch of the default icon and GTK themes, and the welcome tool lets you pick Brave or Microsoft Edge as your browser, plus there's a new Chrome OS-like layout for the desktop. Now we'll have to see in the future when Budgie moves away from GNOME if Ubuntu Budgie follows suit or does something else. Ubuntu 22.04 isn't revolutionary, it's an LTS, it needs to be stable, and it still suffers from the same problems that made me not recommend it anymore to beginners, outdated packages in the repos, and snaps that just don't receive the attention they need to shine on the Linux desktop. But this time, the mishmash of older GNOME versions seems mitigated, and I hope Ubuntu continues on this trend to keep up to date with GNOME. And it also restarted adding stuff to GNOME that GNOME doesn't ship by default. A better dock, better desktop icons, accent colors. It's good to see Ubuntu trying to bring something new to the table instead of just slapping a dock and calling it a desktop. It's a good thing. I also like the fact that they moved to Wayland by default because while this new display server thingy is not perfect yet, it's almost close to being totally usable by everyone and it just needs that big push from a huge distro like Ubuntu to be able to just move over to that next step. So all in all, it's the same conclusion every time. If you like Ubuntu and it's enough for you, then there is no reason not to upgrade. And if you didn't like Ubuntu or Snaps before, you still won't want to move to it with this release. I for one will stick to Fedora for the time being and I'll see how well Fedora 36 treats me. Today's sponsor always treated me well though. Slimbook makes desktops and laptops that ship with Linux pre-installed out of the box. You get a pick from multiple distributions, you get all the keyboard layouts you might want, they ship worldwide, and they have a huge range of devices from all-in-ones to desktop towers to mini PCs to laptops, gaming laptops, ultrabooks, cheaper models. Basically, there's no way you can't find something that suits your needs from their catalog. I use their Slimbook Pro X14 laptop, I use their Slimbook Chimera desktop, I even use their Slimbook RGB keyboard. So if you think you might need a new device that has Linux pre-installed on it and you want to give it a shot, click the link in the description below and get your own device right now. Now thanks everyone for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't stay to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to leave a comment. And if you didn't like the video, you can also dislike and tell me why in the comments as well. If you want to help support the channel, you can join my Patreon subscribers or my YouTube members. Both get access to the same perks, the weekly Patreon cast on Monday and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thanks everyone for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!